we're going to talk about plant design for manual dismantling facilities in terms of what. So I'm going first to tell you what is, it is not being to, uh, about. It's not about legislation and policy because you will have to sort that out before you start planning a facility. It's not about concrete technologies, buying this machine or this other machine, because um, we're just talking about the space that you need to apply certain technologies. Uh, funding and financing is also not exactly what we're going to talk about, because you will, in every country, uh, costs are very different. And also, next here. Okay. Whoa. It's not continuing right now, which is very weird. I'm sorry. Um, apparently, the the application got caught, but now it's continuing. Uh, all in all, what I'm saying is that I can't give you any copy-paste solutions um, because, of course, staff planning uh, will be also something that you will have to sort out. And the reason why I can't give you a, a, an answer uh, for everybody, a, a final answer, is because every country and every market has peculiarities that are just different one from the other. So that's uh, the reason why I can't just give you a copy-paste plant for you to then implement in your country. Then the next step is to see what you want to consider definitely before you start planning. You need to think about where are you getting your uh, e-waste from. So how is collection uh, going to happen and the transport? How is it going to get to your facility? How are you going to get enough of e-waste and where from and how? Okay. Then important is to know what is going to be the input mix, which kind of products or appliances are you going to get? And because that's the reason why that is important is because those consist of very different kinds of output materials. So when you later on think about the downstream options, you have to think about uh, your input mix so you can then <laughs> talk about output uh, possibilities. Then you have to estimate quantities. How much of what kind of appliances will you be going to get? Storage space will depend on the quantities and on the kind of appliances. How much space will you need to receive and then to treat and then again to put out the materials that you're going to get? Further, the level of technology to be applied is important. The tools and the machines that you have at your disposal and the expertise of your workforce that you're going to employ that is available on the market, on the labor market. And then the above mentioned downstream options, who is going to buy your recycling materials and where will you put your hazardous fractions? After sorting out all these questions, then we come to the point. Now what this lecture will be about. It's about workflow and spatial considerations for manual dismantling facilities. That means just going um, with the flow of the material, you first receive all you, you get. You have an input control station. You have a selection, manual dismantling, the treatment of the e-waste, storage space, and internal transport, to go from one of the stations to the other, and in the end, you have output. So let's see into this step by step. 
Uh, the first step, as I said before, is the receiving of the input, the transport. So please consider, is it more like the, the woman on the left uh, carrying something on her head, or is it more like a big truck or something in between, a pickup or a small truck or a tricycle that is going to bring your e-waste? Because the big truck obviously needs more space to come into your facility to get out again. And on the right bottom, you see an image. If you have a hydraulic platform on this truck, it will need even more space because you have to lower that and then unload. So think about which kind of transport medium you will have available. Then, as a next step, um, you have to think whether you will be receiving uh, everything loose, the ways of transport, or if you have containers. And the different kinds of containers might be sacks or big bags or then uh, pallets and uh, pallet cages. Uh, lattice cages of, in metal that are very durable, very hard, uh, worn, um, don't, don't wear out as quickly as plastic ones. So think about that. Next step is the unloading of that material. Um, will you do that manually? Just, well, hopefully with gloves or with a wheelbarrow or with a pallet truck or with a forklift, electric one or a diesel one. The electric one will need a charging station. Well, then you have to see into what are you getting. On the left, you see a mix of large and small appliances. On the right, you see a whole sea of different things. So it's all kind of appliances, and what you have to check is whether you're allowed to receive, to store, and to treat exactly this type of equipment that is coming in according to your legislation that applies to your country or to, to your region. So you have to control how much is going in, how much is coming in, and you can choose a platform scale or a pallet truck scale. That's the thing on the right-hand side, which is a pallet truck with a scale built in. So you, the, the advantage of this one is that you can move around and you don't have a fixed spot for the scale. Uh, the advantage of the other one is that you, well, you do have a fixed spot and don't have to drive it around. So you have to decide when you design the workflow, which uh, version you're going to choose. And then there's cost as well. The pallet truck scale is almost a double in price uh, than uh, the conventional uh, platform scale. Now, uh, you have to make your accounts. It's not only that you weigh and then walk away. Of course, you have to make the accounts and say how much and take note of how much you have in terms of input. And what you take account of is what, how much, where it comes from, and where it goes to, the e-waste that you're going to treat, or even more points according to your legislation and certification standards. In this case, as you see in the image, it's a computer-based system where the scale is directly linked to the computer system. If you don't have that, at least you have to take notes manually. The next step, after you have weighed and accounted your input, is the selection that is the separation of incoming equipment according to types. Um, and that makes sense uh, in two instances. For the first thing, it makes sense because you can then separate everything that might be repairable, that is fit for preparation for reuse. 
And the second reason is that as soon as you get a large variety of very different types of we, like microwaves on one hand, computers on the other hand, and then vacuum cleaners, that's very different in terms of technology, in terms of workforce, and who's going to be trained to dismantle that. And if you have a selection, then groups of appliances can be allocated to specific workplaces. That means that probably after some time, if your work as a force is a stable one, um, then you have a specialization of your workers and they get more routine and more efficient, and that means more output. Now, the selection could work like this. First, you separate large and small appliances. Large would be washing machines, dishwashers, large office printers, and for instance, microwaves. The small ones are all other electric and electronic equipment, and there you can again differentiate IT equipment. You have printers and scanners, vacuum cleaners, and various small equipment, all the rest like high-fee equipment, cameras, blenders, toasters, the mixer in your kitchen, other kitchen aids, power tools, whatever you can think about. Now, what it looks like is this. We, I, I put four steps here. The first one is you identify, okay, um, you identify sorry, products that go to reuse. Then you cut off the power cable of the rest of the appliances that are definitely not working. And then you separate the waste by type. Here you can see a lattice box just with microwaves. And then you give over, hand over the e-waste by type of appliance to specific workplaces. So as soon as you have done that, we will look into the workplace where the dismantling uh, takes place. Uh, you have different kinds of workplaces. Uh, the one on the, the large picture is here at the DRZ in Vienna. On the right-hand side is a workplace in Panama, and then the small picture on the right is in Ghana. Now, what we would uh, recommend in any case, how, however you organize the workspace, that you have to consider to have sufficient space so you can put the appliance before you, just in front of you. You need space for your tools and for the separated fractions after dismantling. And there might be country-specific legislation or regulation um, referring to workspaces. Now, um, the workbench to dismantle small appliances for small equipment would look more or less like this. These are examples where you can see there's a workbench in the center. You have large containers that are to hold the large fractions, the large volume, uh, volume sector fractions like ferrous metals, plastics, and the mixed fraction. Then you have medium containers uh, on the side that are, for instance, for aluminum or printed wiring boards, for cables. And then you need small containers, as you can see here on the right, which is a dismantling place for printers, for small fractions like batteries, capacitors, lamps, or for the valuable fractions, the RAM and the processor. For the large equipment, the ideal, of course, would be to have a platform that is about knee height, um, that is slightly larger than the one for small appliances, and very sturdy, strong structure, and with a height that is between 50 and 60 centimeters, that is approximately 20 to 24 inch. What you can see here is not exactly the ideal. What you can see is that people improvise. They work on the floor, have to bend their backs. That gives them back ache at some point, or they have to uh, be on the floor like this. So what they then uh, turn to on the right side, you see on the image, they use one large appliance as a pedestal and then put the next one on top 
So that then gives you an ergonomically better solution. Now, you can organize your various, when you have several dismantling uh, places, workplaces, you can arrange them in different layouts. Now, the criteria for arranging them is always thinking about the workflow. You have to bring material appliances to each workplace. Um, you have to think if they are going to be stationary, if, if the layout is going to stay as it is for a long time. You have to use your space efficiently. And then you have to position all the elements in the time-saving way. So you save time when you have to throw away your refractions into the right container. You save time when you get your new appliance to, in, to dismantle. We have different layouts here. Sorry, I will go back one. We have a layout on the left side here where you have um, facing each other workbenches and then containers for the fractions in the middle so that can be shared. On the right-hand side, again, the DRZ in Vienna, where we have the larger fraction containers on the left. And then um, so people, the one who works on the right-hand side uh, will have to walk a little bit longer than the guy who works here. Now, the next picture um, is an arrangement where you have uh, the workbenches in rows, and then each workbench has, again, uh, containers on the side. And then the last picture on the right side shows a conveyor belt system, which we're not going to continue to go into detail because I don't think that is exactly what anybody of us will be setting up. I just wanted to show it to you. Now, you might want to buy additional equipment, such as a cable stripper, a plastic shredder, or a, a compactor. These are examples. There is a cable stripper on the left side. In the middle, you, you have a plastic shredder. And on the right-hand side, a, met, a metals compactor. They each have their space requirements. So you have to see how you get your material into the machine, how you get the fractions then away from the machine, and so on, and, and who is going to work on the machine. For very special equipment, there is special treatment, such as cooling appliances, which should definitely not be treated as in the way on the small picture here on the left, which is in Agobloshi in Accra, Ghana, where people just open the cooling appliances without any um, care about health or safety or environment. So what you should at least do is what is in this larger picture here is to open the cooling circle circuit um, by degassing and taking the oil out. But actually, probably the best solution would be to have a closed uh, circle, um, big, big uh, plant as the one on the, on, in the middle here, which would then treat many, many fridges at the same time, maybe up to 1,000 per year or something like that. And another very special appliance is the CRT, where the manual dismantling of the case is not that difficult. But when it comes to separating the glass, then you have the image on the right-hand side on, at the bottom where you see a device, a machine, where you can lower this hood so you protect the worker from the fumes and the powders that are inside. And that, of course, needs, needs space. You need a special space for that. Now, you might want to ask me, so how do I know how many workers I need and therefore how many workplaces? There's kind of a formula which I will explain. That is input, for instance, in kg, you can do it in pounds and whatever, in tons, whatever you want. 
but you have to be consistent with this. So you have cages on top and cages at the bottom. So input in whatever, in weight per day. And then on the, the, the bottom side, you have dismantled weight per person per day. And that gives you the number of workplaces you will need. Now, you have to find out first by experience be it now from your own facility that will start very slowly with one or two workers or from someone else who has a facility running already, what is the expected input? So how much e-waste are you going to get? The throughput capacity, so how much are you able to treat per workplace, per person, per time unit? per day, per week, per month, per year, whatever you choose, but then again be consistent here uh, with the units that you use. And then consider your workforce hours, because if you find out that a worker will be able to dismantle so and so many kilograms in one day, you have to consider that he or she will be on holiday, on sick leave, and so on. So you can't just go through with um, making the, the addition here for the whole year because you will have some cut downs in that. With this formula, you can then calculate the number of dismantling workplaces needed. And then don't forget to plan additional staff because you don't have staff only for dismantling directly. You have administration, transportation, management, and they also need room to work. Now, the workshop space, the floor space, depends again on the amount of input you're going to get, the throughput capacity, so how quickly you're able to work through that amount of input the number of workstations you're going to put up, and then the intermediate storage and transport areas. So always plan sufficient space, so one worker is not stepping on the feet of the other, but still having short distances in mind. Um, then we have another measuring, that is the height for the entrance or exit of material, that depends on the means of transport. If you have a forklift, then be careful because the entrance or the exit does have to be as high or well, uh, uh, actually higher than the forklift, of course. And the room height uh, might depend on the legislation in your country, but then common sense tells you that it also depends on ventilation requirements. So that's the next thing we're going to look at health and safety. That um, has to do with the spatial, again, aspects and not with PPE, personal protective equipment, because that we just assume that it's clear that you, your workers use that. So you provide good ventilation for, so you have fresh air for the workers. You provide good lighting. Why is that? It costs money if you put electrical lighting. It does, but if you use LED lights, it doesn't um, spend that much money on electricity. Uh, and they need it because otherwise their eyes might get bad because screws are sometimes very tiny on the electronic devices. And then there's temperature regulation. In very hot climates, a fan might be of great help and in cool climates, of course, you need some heating. Now, uh, a second thing that is almost even uh, more important is the whole workflow and organization of your place. You have to keep the traffic areas clear. Uh, it's a good idea to have defined areas for each activity so you don't trip over things, so things don't fall of a pile or something like that. These two examples that I'm showing here, you can see it's very clean on the floor. It's clear where the transport traffic areas are. It's clear where the different boxes go. So that helps to keep the place accident-free. 
Now, you need ancillary spaces, extra spaces for changing for the workers, for your, depending on the number of employees. You have changing rooms, washrooms, and toilets, and that uh, for both uh, genders. So if you employ women and men, you need separate washrooms and changing rooms. And then you need some kind of recreation area for people to spend their breaks. So we see here one indoor, one outdoor. Um, you might provide both or one or the other, depending on the climate. The next big issue, the topic, is storage space. First, I'm going to talk about the types of storage space. We start again with the incoming appliances before selection. You have to put them somewhere when they come off the truck or the tricycle or the bicycle. Then after selection, when they are supposed to go for dismantling, should be close to the dismantling workplaces. Then after dismantling, you have the fractions that come out of this process again, should be close to the dismantling workplaces so the workers don't need to walk around far to take the fractions to the right container. And you need to separate hazardous components and recy recycling fractions. You might need intermediate storage if you want to accumulate certain amounts of one material before selling it because your downstream partner might ask for a certain critical mass of material. You have to store hazardous fractions before they're being taken away. High value fractions might need a special lockable space. And then the output that is ready for takeaway, again, needs somewhere to be put. And it can be indoor, depending on what it is, and outdoor. Now we'll see some examples exactly in this order as I explained it just now. So we have first what has come in and has been unloaded from the truck before selection. We have everything mixed inside here, all kinds of appliances. And here we have washing machines piled up so nobody can work on them. So after selection, we have always one kind of uh, appliance in one lattice box. This is just vacuum cleaners. This is just printers, I think, and so on. So it's all separated. The third step is the fractions after dismantling. So we have in the upper image um, hazardous fractions. We have capacitors, and then we have small fractions like screws that always would fall through the lattice box. So we first um, accumulate them here and then put them into the ferrous metal box. And other recycling materials like motors and plastics from vacuum cleaners go separate after dismantling. After this step, the fourth, uh, you have an intermediate storage where if you are able to, do, technically, you can pile up the lattice boxes or this paluxes, or you can store things in big bags. Extra storage is needed for the hazardous fractions. They need to be stored in lockable barrels that are acid proof, and uh, a special box is needed and a special storage method for lithium ion uh, batteries. If you have large amounts before they're taken away, then you need a storage space that is lockable, that has a special impermeable floor. And for the high value fractions, you might want to lock them away as well before you have enough to sell it for a good price. And then at the very last, we have the output. Here we have large containers for the most frequent and the most volum voluminous uh, fractions, like ferrous metals, mixed traction, and plastics. And we have a forklift that can tilt and uh, throw them in here. And then a big truck comes and takes it away. Now, uh, to go from one of these points to the other, uh, between those storage spaces, you need internal transport and you need equipment for that. 
you might be carrying things as on, you see on the left side by hand or on your, your head. You might use smaller containers that can be carried by one person or two people with these handles. You might have a wheelbarrow or a pallet truck or a forklift. So depending on the, how you're, you're equipped technically, you have to think about how the transport will flow. Then you also have to think about who is going to be doing the internal transport. Depending on how many workplaces you have, um, it could be a good idea to have a dedicated person, a person just for the internal transport, bringing the appliances from the delivery, from input to the scale, from the scale to selection, from selection to the workplaces, and so on. For smaller facilities, um, that could well be the same person as uh, the person who does the selection, who sorts out the appliances. Now, for administration and management, office areas, of course, you all know what they look like, so we don't need many pictures here, but think about um, who is going to do what and how many people you will need. You have an administration in terms of substance accounts um, that was close to the scale, as we saw before. You need permission papers, staff management, taxes, at least you have to prepare your papers for taxes, even if you go to an um, chartered accountant. Then, uh, depending on the size of your facility, you might have a head of department for dismantling. That is someone who does um, train the employees when they first come gives them working instructions as they work along, um, someone who manages the tools, the means of transport, and the in and output. Um, if you have a very small facility, this might be the same person as the general management. This is the person who does the contacts and contracts with input providers, the downstream partners who buy your fractions or take your hazardous fractions with the authorities perhaps the media and advocacy groups and marketing. Now, this is something I have to apologize for because this is now probably what you all have been waiting for. So how big will it be? How much will it cost and, and all that? But I am not able to answer that right now because I haven't come to that point. If I manage, we will, of course, send out to the participants also this uh, slide uh, with filled in numbers here and figures. At the moment, I don't have them. But uh, what I have given you is a notion of what you have to consider. And it might be then clear when you go from one step to the other, more or less approximately how big every partial space of those has to be. So, and in any case, it's only a rough guideline because it varies so much from country to country. So as a last slide, I will show you just a suggested layout of a plant where you have at the top left a sorting area, an input area. Then you have, it's dis distributed to the different workplaces there are five dismantling desks here. We have an additional area for cable stripping and crushing workshop and a CRT tube workshop. I showed you the machines and this is a, a suggested space for that. Then on the sides here and next to the workplaces, we have the containers for the different fractions. And then we have a storage space for the outgoing department a small office, and a special storage for hazardous waste. And then it has to go out again, so we have a truck loading ramp here. So I think I've come to an end. What is left to me is to wish you a lot of success if you're really planning to set up a facility. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them, but I'll, I'll ask Elizabeth if we do that now or after the next expert presentation. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Olivier Mbera. Um, I'm the country manager for, for Ingaro, South Rwanda. Um, I'm going to share with you um, what we are doing with uh, our EWS facility and uh, uh, the process that led to, to the setup of, 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 of this facility. So um, Katarina has really um, explained very well um, the technical details. Um, I will also try to go um, into um, into some uh, some some details that uh, let us uh, be able to set up um, a facility, and up to now we see it uh, as as a, as a success. So um, I, I will just present the key steps um, used. Um, then the key stakeholders that were part of, of, of this. Um, and you know, before um, setting setting up um, a plant, um, as Katarina said, you have to know um, the quantities of e-waste that will be processing in the facility, and you need to know what um, what is in the country. So in Rwanda, um, we, we did an inventory first to know um, the quantities that are generated um, per year uh, to be able to um, to set up to know the size of the plants that we must put in place and and, and the type of machines that are, that are going to be used. We also worked on the on the legal framework because um, for you to really have um, more inputs at the facility, you, you need to have a proper regulation in place and so on. And then at, um, at the end, we we we. After seeing all of that, we we did um, we planned um, infrastructure and uh, we uh, we invited. Um, this was done uh, through a public-private uh, partnership. So um, so starting on on the step one, um, we um, as I said, we identified um, key stakeholders, both uh, public and private, um, um, who are necessary for. Um, to be able to put up in place a sustainable recycling system. Um, we conducted an inventory um, to know the quantities, the location, because uh, we, we did not only set up um, the, the, uh, the recycling facility, but also we set up the collection points around the country. So we need to know um, which district is generating more quantities and so on, so that's why we really did a detailed inventory to to know the quantities, the type, and so on. Of, 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 um, we also worked with the different government um, authorities um, to put in place um, regulation and policy framework. Um, and then um, we, we started um, the setup of um, infrastructure, um, as I said, through um, a public-private partnership. So let let me start with um, the the stakeholders. Um, you know, we were looking at um, especially we were targeting um, people who have um, who are back users who have who generate a lot of um, of, uh, of electronic waste. So uh, we we're looking at um, uh, mostly government institution because um, in in a small country like Rwanda. Um, Government is a key uh, contributor to the generation of, of U.S. We were also looking at um, a big uh, telecommunication companies, um, universities, and so on. So we we um, established um, relationship with them. We invited them in different meetings, and actually, the inventory we did um, was also looking at. Uh, what quantities are what what type of equipment they are using and what they are able to to generate we looked we worked also um, with regulatory authorities and government ministries um we looked at um at IE, uh, the handlers the retail shops and, and of course um some um, downstream um companies that um um that after the recycling, we have to sell uh, metals and, and, and other other fractions. So we also um, uh, considered uh, 
producers as as as, as key stakeholders. Um, um, you know, um, we looked at the companies that we we the companies that we that have representation um, in our country. Um, we looked at their Samsung, Nokia, um, and some um, Chinese brands that are on the market like Techno, Konka, and, and so on. They are big contributors of um, electronic equipment such as telephones and so on. Um, so after identifying stakeholders, um, we did um, a countrywide um, inventory um, to know uh, the quantities that are being generated in Rwanda per, 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 per year and, and, and of course future projections. Uh, uh, we, we were looking at different um, districts uh, for us to be able to um, to even plan for the collection centers. Um, yeah, we, we, we seen that um, Rwanda as a small country was generating around um, 10,000 to 15,000 tons per year um, of, 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 of U.S. And, and we saw that um, there was an undergrowth <laughs> of almost yeah, So um, yeah. the data here, um, the data on U.S. Um, generation um, helped us to, to set up the plant. Of course, we were also um, considering, um, because Rwanda is um, strategically located, we were, um, you know, we looked first on, on, on Rwanda, what Rwanda can generate, but also we, we were targeting um, some neighboring regions, some neighboring countries to see what also they are, they are generating. Um, so, um, as I said, for, a facility to work um, or to be sustainable, you you have also to um, to look on 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 on, on the um, legal framework. Um, mm -hmm. So when we looked at um, the environmental law that one was there, um, we find that um, there was no provision for 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 e waste. Um, so um, we worked with the government to. With the Minister of Environment and the, uh, the Environmental Management Authority to to revise um, the, the the environmental law to include um, articles uh, on e-waste management. This is very key because um, you know, as I said, um, if we look at the bulk users um, among the bulk users, government is there, and uh, um, initially uh, government was auctioning. Um, different equipment. So um, we wanted to make sure that if we set up this kind of facility, um, government um, equipment or used equipment will be um, will be delivered or will be uh, will not go through um, the normal um, procurement procedures that are used by uh, by the government. So that's why we we, we really looked at at um, the legal framework. We also worked with the. Uh, um, the, the, the regulatory authority um, in Rwanda to put up um, U.S. regulation. Uh, you know, uh, in in Africa and especially um, East Africa, there are so many. Um, um, I can say um, uh, cherry pickers or informal sector um, Chinese people um, moving around and collecting the boards and so on. So we um, we really said. Um, the facility will not work if we don't have um, regulation uh, so that um, people who are working in this sector are really uh, regulated and have um, uh, have proper facilities for, for, for dismantling. So um, so that's why we um, even worked with the regulatory authority to put in place um, the, the regulation. But also the government take um, more steps to Put up um, um, the policies uh, that were um, were approved even before the facility was um, was was on. Um, so um, we supported the government to translate um, some documents um, into the local language. 
so that people can understand. And um, we were part of the technical team that um, that developed um, the the, um, the the standards for um, for uh, for for US management in Rwanda. Um, so as I said, in terms of infrastructure, um, in Barrow South Rwanda, we partnered with the government of Rwanda to uh, to establish um, the, the the recycling facility, but also um, the the collection centers. So um, the upper photo you see is um, this the recycling facility, and down here are some um, collection centers um, which are established um, around the country. Um, so uh, Katarina talked about um, about the 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 design um, of of the recycling um, plants. This, this is um, this is um, uh, our design, um, our plant, the plant size. Um, the plant has has a capacity to treat um, uh, ten thousand tons of e-waste per year. Um, yeah, of course, as I said, we 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 base to be able to put up such plant, we based on the inventory. Um, and and the size the size of the plant is um, 1,500 square meter. Uh, we have um, different lines um, inside here. We we have uh, dismantling tables, which I will show um, in the next presentation. Um, we have um, cathode ray tube uh, treatment lines. Um, we have small um, machines like. Um, Cable crushers and so on. We have metal, <coughs> sorry, we have metal um, bearing and packing, and and in between um, 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 we have plastic crushing and washing line. And, and as you can see, um, we we have storage um, spaces, um, uh, storage for um, for raw uh, for raw material for you know um, for electronic incoming materials and, and storage um, for, for outgoing uh, materials. Um, our plant is also equipped with um, with uh, uh, dust um, treatment uh, machines, dust collectors um, to protect, um, you know, to, to, to ensure that um, uh, environmental um, consideration are in place, but also to, pro to ensure that this, the health and safety of our Workers are uh, protected. So the, the, uh, each dismantling tables is connected to the um, to the dust um, collection machine, dust and emission collection machine. Um, we also have um, down here um, the um, water treatment. Uh, we are recycling um, all the water that uh, we are using in the plant um, and to be used again. In the plastic washing and and and, and crushing. Um, so um, this is um, our process flow chart, um, which I will explain um, um, in in summary um, quickly. Um, we we start with the um, um, collection of e waste. Um, uh, we we um, we have we are now using three type of collection mechanism. We use um, the business to business, where institution invite us, and we or we contact the institution, and we go to collect directly uh, from there. We, we we send our truck and to collect directly from the their institution. We also have um, a collection point or a drop off point um, around the country. So that um, individual people can um, um, drop. For the moment, we have four, but we we are aiming to have at least um, a collection point in each um, district. Um, we also um, use uh, we also have partnership with um, solid waste collection companies that goes um, door to door to to go and and, and collect from. Uh, from um, household household uh, people. Um, so when we receive um, when we receive waste, we we we, we go through um, 
um, the documentation and weighing and, and of course recording um, um, what is asked about uh, about the software um, we we also have um, uh, a, a small software that we are using for um, for recording um, the, 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 the equipment um, um, but we want to there are some details that are missing that we want to to really um, include um, then um, we after we do segregation you know different we receive almost um, hundred types of types of um, electronic waste computers printers so on household uh, equipment so we, we we do segregation um, and then um, storage before um, any testing then for um, for especially um, uh, computers printers um, we, we 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 do testing to see if they can be um, they can be refurbished um, so if we see that um, this equipment can be refurbished we take it to our um, we have uh, a separate refurbishment department um, we take it to the refurbishment department and if um, um, there is any part that or any spare part that's missing we add it we don't buy spare parts um, outside we just harvest uh, spare parts from from different um, materials so um once once refurbished we um we, we we the refurbished computers printers and so on we send it to to school we have um a strong partnership with um, uh, the Rwanda education board um, so we um we we sell a lot of computers to to refurbished computers to school um at a low cost uh, we we used to donate um some equipment to them but now we are for business purposes we are selling at, at a lower at a lower price and we 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 ensure that um uh, we, we we can maintain them but also we ensure that if these equipment are no longer working they are being returned to our to our facility for for, for recycling so what cannot be um refurbished directly goes into um the dismantling um uh, for you know we dismantle for two purposes actually for um for separating the hazardous um, materials and the non-hazardous. Um, among the non-hazardous, we have, um, sorry. Among the non-hazardous, we have different metals. Um, you know, steel, copper, aluminum. We have different plastic. Um, and also we have um, some hazardous equipment. So for the, um, for some materials, for the metals especially, we um we, we we compress them properly um print them and we we set it to um to um smelters we have um local smelters of steel um of copper and aluminium um for plastic um you know plastic we have also different type um we currently locally we have um on recyclers of high high density uh, plastic. So for other plastic, we are currently um, stalling them, um, still waiting for for, for for solution. We are working on on the project of um, of um, making um, uh, plastic papers from from um, from you know the non contaminated, the non brominated. Um, uh, Retardant uh, plastic. So, um, for some parts, um, but like circuit boards um, and so on, uh, for the moment we don't have the local um, capacity to to, uh, to retrieve or to recover uh, precious metals from from um, from the boards. So we send it to our um, our um, main recycling facility which is um, located um, in Dubai same as um, screens and lithium um, batteries 
there are other um, different um, platforms which are not listed on 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 on, on, on the flow diagram. But uh, if you have any question on it, I will I will be able to answer. So this our this is our um, this is our dismantling tables. Um, um, and, and uh, we have well trained technicians um, that um, dismantle different um, equipment. Um, down here, is, um, up here is, uh, is the CRT um, cutting um, cutting line, uh, and also um, the metal beller. Um, you know this the CRT treatment process. Uh, we we, we um, you know um, we receive a lot of CRTs. Um, in Rwanda because um, you know uh, these equipment have um, I think they have been shipped from from different countries to come to to Africa so we really receive a big number of, of them um, so this is our emission treatment um, system as I said um, they are linked to each um, dismantling table. Um, yeah um well we we have um we have other machines that are not shown here like the plastic crushing and so on um oh, sorry. so um so um we also did a lot of awareness to um just to to be able to uh, um to receive um to be able to to, to increase the quantity received by the facility, so we um, one of the strategy we use is to um, invite all media in the country to to come to to the facility. We show them um, the process. We show them um, the the hazardous materials we are um, extracting from from um, from uh, from electronic equipment, so that they can really um advocate or they can use can use their voice to communicate to the people but also um it's not only um the media uh, we, we we have we have been um uh, inviting um different government stakeholders um private companies and so on to uh, um to come to come to visit our facility and then um, so that we can really uh, enter into agreement with uh, with with them now we have um we have agreement with uh, with the uh, um different um uh, telecommunication companies in Rwanda solar companies so we, we are we are the their disposal partner and now um we have after this we have seen um the quantity uh, increasing uh we are also um conducting awareness of uh, of, of, of of the um the population we have um we we have been implementing load shows um we are really we want to continue to to um to do it through um the um in rwanda it's 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 uh last saturday of the month we have the general um um Screening for minute work, so we we want to use this framework. We have been using the framework, but we want to continue to use the framework to to educate the people about um, the dangers and benefit of, of of proper of proper recycling. Um. So um, you know, just um, these are the um the the results after um after one one year um. It was um, 2000, um, uh, 2018, and after one year of operation, um, we we have been able to collect um, um, seven seven hundred tons of of of, of, of US. Um, and you know, um, in the in, these were collected in just four months because um, um, we. We had uh, we had uh, other six months for for um, for the commissioning and and, 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 and proper setup of, of, of the plant. So now now um, 
up to now we have reached um up to three thousand tons of, 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 of US currency. So um we have been able to create um four hundred thirteen jobs um through um you know the, the collection. We have collection agents around the country, but also we have people um who are doing um uh, technician employed and other people who are doing uh direct job like of loading and loading of of of, of um of electronic equipment. Um uh, we calculated also the um carbon the tons of carbon dioxide and equivalent emission uh, mitigated and uh, uh this is uh, very good for environment and uh, you know in the in the four months also we of, of, of last year we have been able to um to refurbish more than one thousand two hundred almost three hundred um uh, computer, refurbished computers. Um, up to now, we are around um, around four thousand computers uh, refurbished. Um, so we we have learned um, um, lessons from uh, through um, the whole process. Um, we have seen that um, uh, public private partnership um, is really key for for for, for the success of any. E waste management facility, um, um, especially um, in Africa, where um, uh, big quantities are owned by the government, where the government is um, is responsible to regulate um, different sectors. So um, it's really key um, to have um, partnership with any uh, public institution. So um, we we see also that. Um, uh, continuous in involvement of um, of um, key stakeholders is, is, is very key, um, especially um, because um, awareness levels are, are very still are, are very low um, uh, in Africa, and we we need uh, really the involvement of of everyone. Also, um, media media has been essential for us. Um, if you go to um, YouTube, you will see a lot of um, articles or videos on on, on US facility in Rwanda, and um, um, the, the media has really allowed the people to know that um, this facility exists, and we have seen a lot of people contacting us and um, uh, disposing of uh, properly um, uh, their their e waste. Um, uh, so I think that's that's it about. Um, Rwanda, um, but for um, for Invalosav in general, um, we are not um, only in Rwanda. We are trying to set up um, uh, facilities in different uh, countries. Um, you know, we um, our headquarters are in Dubai, uh, but um, we are currently um, putting up uh, facilities um, uh, in other countries. Uh, in Africa and, and, and Middle East. So um, this is our um, big recycling hub um, in Dubai, um, which I said is able to um, uh, to uh, process um, um, sub, uh, to recover uh, different type of metals and process what we cannot um, daily process in our in our facility in Rwanda. Um, so um, thank you so much.